Well, it's good to see everybody here. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Broad Street. Good to see everyone this morning. We are in week number four of a sermon series called Four Weeks in Colossae. It's Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, and it's written uh, by the Apostle Paul during his time imprisoned in Rome. It's a beautiful letter to the church and to his people. Once upon a time, there was this young guy who was really into archery and riflery, and he, he really wanted to kind of get his shot perfected, and so he'd often go out and find a place where he could really work on his, his aiming. One day, he was going down a country road, and he saw this huge range, and it was all set up with bales of hay and target practice, and then he saw this barn that had these 40 targets just perfected. So he decided he'd go in there and see if maybe, hey, maybe I can take some time on this range. I'm going to go. He knocks on the door of the house and he finds this old man there. The guy had to be in his early 90s. But, but his hands weren't very steady. He kind of shook as he, he opened the door and the young boy looked at him and he thought, what in the world? He said, sir, I, I noticed all of the, the targets and, and, and in the center of the target, there's a, there's a hole and none of the targets have any misses on them. They're perfect, dead center. The, the crosshair split on all 40 of the targets. Who's the, who's the expert marksman here? The old man looked at the boy and he said, he said I, I'm the one who made those targets. And he thought to himself, he goes, how long ago did you do that shot, right? And so he said, when, when, did you, when did you do that? And he said, oh, most of those targets were done in the last couple of weeks. And he said to him, he said, from like five feet or what? How, you know, what are you doing here? And he said, no, I, I practiced at about 150 yards. And the boy looked at him, he said, sir, I, I, I'd like for you to train me. Would you teach me how I can become a better marksman? And he said, son, here's what I do. He said, I, I put a, a, a target up, and then I take my shot. And then after I find where that hole crosses through the target, then I paint the bullseyes around it. <laughs> Perfect every time. Can, can I just speak real honestly to you today? Um, I feel like that's kind of the condition of our world. I feel like that's the condition of our world. We take a shot, you know, the ready, fire, aim technique of life. And then once we've made a hole somewhere, then we come back and start to justify where our, our shot landed. And it doesn't matter what the impact of that shot is. We just come back and start justifying around that target. And, and I'm not a political guy, and so I, I don't want to talk about Republicans or Democrats. I'm Canadian, okay? But I want to say to you, our nation is practicing this make a hole and, and then justify everything around it every day. And I don't care which side of the aisle you sit on. That's what we're doing. And here's what's really scary. It may start off here on this kind of macro umbrella of us as a nation, but the truth is it just straight tickles down from top to bottom. And we shoot and we fire, we make holes, and then we justify. And it's impacting our, 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 our state. It's impacting our, our county. It's impacting our, our local reality. But what's scary is, I don't really move much in those circles. It's coming in the church. It's coming in the home. It's coming in the way that we treat our wives and our husbands. It's coming in the way that we treat our neighbors and interact with the people at work and our friends at school. We make holes, we do damage, and then we come back and we justify our behavior so that we feel good about ourselves. And here's the problem. We are doing damage across the board to each other and, frankly, to ourselves. 
the letter to the Colossians. It's this beautiful text. And here's what Paul says. There's that reality of the way that the world lives. Shoot and then justify. Or there's this other way. The kingdom way. And I want to go through it very quickly with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 4. We're going to pick right up at verse 1. Now, Colossians is a tough book to find sometimes. Uh, if you remember this, you know, you can find the end books pretty easy, the Gospels, the Old Testament. But Colossians, you know, if, you, if you remember this, go eat popcorn, all right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. You can find it real easily. Um, one of the challenges for finding it, however, is having a Bible with you. Um, so you might want to work on that next week a little bit. Uh, but let's look at Colossians 4, and we're going to start right at verse 1. And, and, and please, as I'm, as I'm sharing this morning, hear this. And, and it's, to me, it's just not a joke. Hear the difference between the world and the way that we make holes and then justify in the way that I believe the kingdom really should operate. All right, listen to us here. Colossians, we're just right at the beginning. It says, masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember, you also have a master in heaven. Now, a lot of people read this and go, the, the Bible justifies slavery. That's just straight out wrong. No. Paul is speaking into a culture where the slavery reality was already in existence. Paul is speaking justice into the issue of slavery. Now, slavery in the biblical period wasn't like what we understand in the modern era, where human beings were, were sold into an indentured reality where absolute tyranny and oppression and the, the reality that life might be taken beatings and whippings. That's not the era of the first century idea of slavery. But because it existed, Paul had to speak into it. And what does he say? If you have a slave, treat them with justice and be fair to them. Oh, by the way, each of you, he says, right in verse one, are slaves also. You see, what Paul sets up is the reality that all of humanity is even at the foot of Christ. In fact, if you read Philippians chapter 2, it talks about Jesus himself came as a doulos, a bond slave to all of humanity. And he says, we should have the mind that Christ had coming as servants or slaves underneath the idea that we serve a holy and just God. In other words... All of humanity, all of humanity is in service to the great God that created and is. And therefore, we should treat each other with justice and with fairness. Now, here's the problem. Life isn't fair. How many times have your parents told you that life isn't fair, right? Yeah, many people are raising both hands right now, yeah. Life isn't fair, and I'm going to tell you a secret. Thank God it's not. I don't want fair. Because the reality is, if I got what I deserved, if I received true fairness, I would be a giant and huge mess. In my life, I've done a couple of good things. I've been involved with some nice activity and been kind to others. But to be honest with you, that's what's expected of me because I'm a human being. Because I'm part of the human order, I should be kind. I should be nice. There is an implied moral code that C.S. Lewis writes about that's emblazoned upon our hearts and upon our minds. These aren't exceptional acts. This is the reality of humanity. We should be kind and we should be good. The problem is I got this other side of the scale for me. And this side of the scale is not what I should have been. 
This is the, the side of the scale that brings up a long legal code, a brief that is written in my history. When I look back to the very near recent, to the somewhat past, and all the way back to my childhood, that list is very painful and very long. I don't want fair. Because fair would mean that I'd have to make a reckoning for all of the stuff that I have neatly tucked away into my closet. The sins that have separated me from a loving God. The sins that have broken relationship with my family, with my friends, with girls and guys in my past. And the damage in the wake that I have behind me is vast and wide. I don't want fair. What's interesting is Paul doesn't say, you get fair and now go treat other people with fair. Here's what he says. Treat those around you, the servants, the slaves, the people around you, all of us being at even level foot at the cross. Every one of us, treat them with justice and be fair to them. In other words, those of us who are followers of Christ are required to treat others with justice and to treat others with fairness, not considering fairness for ourselves. Now, here's what's amazing. If you hear nothing else today, just hear this. What would Bradley County look like if we just treat everyone else fairly and justly? What if every single person followed just simply this first verse? What if everybody in Bradley County just said, I'm going to be fair and I'm going to be just with everyone? Can you imagine the world? Listen, the world would peek into Bradley County and go, there's something different in that area. What is it? News reporters, CNN, Fox News, everyone would be coming just to see what was happening in our little hamlet of the world. What would happen if we acted with justice and fairness for the world? You know that neighbor that you hate? You know who it is, right? They never rake their leaves and they all come onto your yard. You don't have a tree, they do, but you rake and they don't, right? You even saw them last week with a blower kind of shooting them towards your yard, right? Man, I hate that guy, right? What if I just treated him with fairness and justice? What if I took that, that, that seed that's inside of me and I just treated him fairly and justly? What would the commons at school look like? I mean, really. You know that one kid, right? The kid who sits on the end of the, the table. Nobody sits across from him. Nobody ever talks to him. Just by himself all the time, by herself all the time. Maybe, in fact, people, when they get away, they talk about how they look or how they act or kind of just pick at them. What, what if you just sat across the table from them and just said, hey, here's my name. What are you doing today? You struggling with any classes right now? Wow, me too. What would happen if we just decided to follow just simply that first verse, to live out fairness and justice. I believe it would be revolutionary. And I literally believe that our prayer, that we pray all the time, Lord, bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, either we mean that or we don't, right? Either we mean it or we don't. But could you imagine what it would be like if the kingdom came? Could you imagine what it would be like? Can I just say a sign? I have an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old. When I was 11 and 9, Keith, when you were 11 and 9, where did you play when you were a kid? Where? Everywhere, right? You got on a bike and went everywhere, didn't you? Yeah. Well, we're not going to talk about what happens back there, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
I mean, when I was a kid, man, as, as soon as, in summertime, as soon as we woke up, we'd get on bikes, we'd go to the ball field, we were gone until it was dark, and then you'd ride home. We can't do that anymore, Right? Right? We had to buy one of those, you know, the things that the, 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 the things that you look at the stars with, one of those telescopes, right? We had to get a telescope just to keep watching on our kids all through the neighborhood, right? What would happen if we all just treated each other with fairness and justice as God has commanded us to do? Let me keep going. Verse number two, this is what's so great. He says, then devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Okay, here's the command. Dedicate yourself to justice and fairness. Then devote yourself to prayer and gratitude. Now, why is this so powerful when coupled with each other? The only way that I can live out fairness and justice is to be devoted to prayer because my heart is not hardwired to fairness or justice. How about you? Amen. It's not natural. It's not, I don't, I don't just wake up and go, let me see if I can't find a way to bless everybody in the county today, right? But all of a sudden, when my heart turns into prayer, and I start going, man, look at these people out here. You know, two, a couple of weeks ago, I woke up. I came into church, five in the morning, right? There's a guy asleep in that little alleyway between our sanctuary and our, our other building, the annex. You know? My natural inclination inside of me is like, hey, man, get up. We got church. Get out of the way. We can't have people who are a mess around our church, right? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody at church is a mess, right? My heart isn't just naturally wired that way. I need to be in prayer, devoted to prayer, so that I can see the people whose hearts are breaking around me, to see the people who don't know Jesus around me, to see the people who are having unbelievable issues inside of their families and inside of their own personal lives, just like me. And if I don't devote myself to prayer, I'll never get there. Oh, by the way, he says, devote yourself to prayer and to thankfulness, gratitude. What kind of gratitude? What's he talking about here? I've spent some time in the court system over the last couple of weeks. And I know there's some lawyers inside of here. So I'm going to do the best job that I can. But here's what happens. You go into that courtroom and then there's a defendant inside of there. And the defendant stands before the judge and then there's arguments that come and briefs and motions that come. But once it's all done, once it's all wrapped up, that judge will officially make a ruling and then that gavel is swung. And once that ruling comes, everything is final. And that person, that person that's handcuffed and in an orange jumpsuit, ends up having to deal with the consequences and the reality of payment that's due as a result of the verdict. Now, here's the challenge. In my life, the payment for the mistakes that I've made is my life. Eternal separation from God, that's the verdict. It started in the very beginning of time. He said, here's life, here's death, you choose. And the consequences of my life have not been perfect. They have not been stainless. They have not been sinless. And so the verdict for me is, what are you going to do? And I can spend a lifetime trying to do enough good and to pray hard enough and to give hard enough and to serve hard enough, but no matter what I do, that payment I will never be able to replay and Jesus came and he said, I've got it. I'll trade my life for yours. And in spend, instead of spending eternal, eternity separated from God, when you come to meet Jesus, when you come to the Father, Jesus will stretch out his hands over the top of you, over every blemish that's ever been inside of your life. And he says, Father, this one is mine. 
and you will pass from life to life. That's the payment that's been made. So the reality is, I have nothing to offer God but gratitude for he saved my life. Now, I've got an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old. Sometimes I do get nervous when they go out and play in the street because those two don't watch anything. You know, they'll throw the football and somebody will take a post move and get out into the street. They don't care if there's a big truck coming or not. They want to catch that ball. And I pray to God, I pray to God that they're safe. But if one day they were out in the street running down there and a truck was coming, and then another human being saw it happening, and they came through in the middle of the street, and they pushed him and said, Thomas, get out of the road! And they pushed him, and, and in doing so, they sacrificed their life for my son's life. Do you realize what kind of indebted gratitude I would have for that man or that woman? I would spend the rest of my life blessing that person. I would spend the rest of my life writing notes, writing uh, letters to their family saying, you know, thank you so much. I will never forget the gift that you gave. My son has life because you traded yours for my son. And it's very easy for me to understand the ethical weight of someone trading their life for my son's life because I can sit there and see it every day and I can see the reality of what would have happened if a truck would have hit my son. I see it. However, we don't necessarily understand the gift that God traded for us. We haven't seen life separated from God. We don't fully understand or grasp that which is to come. And because of the, the lack of knowledge, the lack of understanding of this, sometimes we don't live in constant gratitude. So here's what Paul says. Devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer that you can live a life in which you are actually living out justice and fairness for the sake of the world because there are some people that don't yet know about this push, this, this, this movement, how God sacrificed his life so that you might live and he traded his life as a substitution for yours and he took the cross so you wouldn't have to. So live your life in fairness and justice for the sake of the world so that all can hear the story of what happened with Jesus. And friends, if we can live out of that gratitude, I mean, really, if we can grasp what that means, all of a sudden, all of life kind of comes into focus, does it not? Let me, let me read just a couple more quick verses here. Here's what he says next. He said, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Do you know where Paul was when he was writing this epistle? Yeah. He was at the Waldorf Astoria in Rome, right? No. Man, he was in prison. He's in prison. And what's amazing is he isn't writing a letter, quick, give me some legal defense. Get me out of this place. Instead, he says, pray for me too because I want to tell the people in prison about what happened in my life. There was a time where I was so blind I didn't see it. In fact, I was wrapped up inside of this legal code about what you eat and where you, where you work and, and the Sabbath and all this stuff that I was running myself ragged with legalism and I didn't realize that God loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus to, to put Push me out of harm's way. Now I'm in prison. Don't try and get me out of prison. Instead, pray for me that I might tell others about the mysterious plan that God has to give them a push to. Encourage me. Pray for me so that I might be faithful with the words that I share with the other people who are here in prison. Pray for me that this mysterious plan of God might grab hold of other people's lives. And when you read the rest of this chapter four, you're going to hear about a prisoner and another prisoner and another prisoner who Paul ministered to in the midst of this prison in Rome. And they went from completely not understanding God's love for them to the place where not only did they understand that God gave them that push, but that they had fully engaged in the work and ministry of the mission of sharing God's love with the world. They 
Then he says, verse five, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Oh, friends, let your conversations be gracious and attractive. Let your conversations be gracious and attractive. Can I, can I tell you what the world thinks of Christians? Or do you already know? Say amen if you already do. You know why? Because we're just a mean and grumpy group of people. We say we love Jesus, but then we speak and act a totally different way. Let your conversations be gracious and let the Christ inside of you be attractive to the world. Students, I'm telling you, your schools need real agents of Christ. They need people that really love Jesus and love him enough to be willing to be gracious. In other words, to offer hope to the world. To be attractive, not attractive to yourself, but to let the, the powerful magnet that is the Holy Spirit draw others unto Jesus. The world needs those kind of kids. Our schools need those kind of people. Not the kind of people that sit there and condemn everybody and say, if you were to die today, you know, where are you going to end up in eternity? No. But the kind of people that go and say, hey, Looks like you're carrying a huge load of books. Can I give you a hand? Can I help you to class? Hey, it looks like you're struggling with chemistry. I'm struggling with chemistry too. Let's struggle together. Gracious and attractive. Colossians 4 ends with this long list of people. And I don't have time to go through them all today, but... You know, some of them are people who have been involved in the work. Some of them are, are people who are now ministering with Paul in prison. And it just goes on to say, look at all of these Ticketus and Articus and all of these people. Luke, the physician, John Mark, the, the, the uh, gospel writer, Barnabas, the financier. They're all in this thing with you. And we're going to create a huge harmony, a huge symphony that takes this message of fairness, justice, Gracious love of Christ, Savior of the world, to the world. That's the picture. Not fire, create holes, and then justify ourselves or our own actions for our own personal gain. But tell the world that God loves them, that God cares for them, and to treat them like you actually mean it. When I was in the seventh grade, I started playing the violin. Who's in seventh grade here? Raise your hand. All right. One person. <laughs> seventh grade stuff. I started playing the violin, and I really got into it. And I know you probably don't believe me, but I was actually pretty good at violin. I got into it. I started getting calluses on my finger. In fact, I rose through the ranks of the orchestra pretty quickly. And eventually, I became a part of the all-city orchestra in Lincoln. It's a big deal, and chicks love guys who play the violin. <laughs> Little hint for you there, boys. <laughs> so I wanted to try out for the, uh, the first chair. The first chair is the concert master of the whole orchestra. And it's a big deal. I mean, you get to stand up, and then you set the tune. Everybody kind of tunes their instrument to you. It's a big deal, right? So I tried out. I'd practiced, rehearsed, rehearsed, and practiced. And then I did my audition, and I didn't get first chair. I got second chair. I was better than first chair, but I still got second chair. But here's what's cool about second chair you still sit in the absolute front of the shell of the orchestra. You sit next to first chair. Now, all of our concerts, we'd wear these really nice suits and we'd be really, really dressed up. But one particular Christmas year, they decided we were gonna do this Christmas concert and they wanted everybody to wear a special outfit for the concert. And so they said, you have to wear white pants 
in a green kind of polo shirt, right? Now, it was the 1980s, and everybody had white pants because it was the rule, right? Everybody had white pants in the 80s. But my family, we didn't have money for polo shirts. My mom had gone to the Kmart, and she had found a, a white uh, kind of old, you know, little golf shirt kind of deal. It wasn't polo, but she came home with it. And she showed it to me. I was like, Mom, it's got to be a green shirt. She said they didn't have any green shirts. They just had these white ones, and we could afford it. I was like, Mom, I'm going to look like an idiot. And she said, no, I've got a plan. She went into the closet and grabbed this box that on the front of it just simply said, Rit Die. <laughs> do you know what Rit Die? Apparently you do, amen? All right, I'm going to help you guys. Rit Die is sort of like what you have on your tie-dye t-shirt, okay? Except the difference is like you can actually wear those. Rit dye is a chemical that I believe was banned in the 1990s because it was making people's hair fall out and stuff like that. So my mom went over to the sink and she mixed up this concoction of water and Rit dye. And then she took the white golf shirt and she dunked it in this thing. And sure enough, this shirt turned perfectly green. It was incredible. So she pulls it out and she hangs it up on the line. And the concert was that night. So I went and put on my writ dye shirt and I put on the white pants. No, no, no. It was great. I looked super. So we sat down and started playing. And man, I was just stringing along. I was doing, I, I, it was a great concert. We're playing Green Sleeve. We're playing all these great Christmas tunes. I mean, the crowd is going crazy. If you've never seen a crowd go crazy over an all city orchestra, man, they can be wild. <laughs> so we got down to the last song and I started realizing there was something not right. <laughs> I mean, there's something really not right. Well, I had kind of worked up a sweat. When you play that violin, you go after it, all right? And the writ dye in my shirt had now commingled with my hot sweat and is running down my body. My white pants have got these green streaks going down it as if a leprechaun had just urinated on my pants. <laughs> Now, the good news is I was sitting down, so really nobody could see it. You know, I just kept strumming along going, dear Lord, let this be the last song. Let this be the last song. And sure enough, it was so good, the crowd was like, woo, yeah, more orchestra, right? You know? And so the conductor decides we all need to stand up and take a bow. <laughs> she says, everybody up. I said, you know what, it'll work because I'll just take my violin and I'll just go, just down like this, right? Cover up, right? The problem is the violin is actually a very small instrument. <laughs> so we all stand up. Everybody, beautiful white pants. Everybody, everybody else probably in the world owned a green polo shirt. Except for me, Captain Rit Dye right there in the middle. And then these green streaks just running down my pants. It was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Because everybody was in harmony and lockstep with each other. We had played so beautifully, and, and everybody looked great, except for that one weird guy right there. Can I just say something to you? Where will the church be in 25 years? I mean, really. I don't want this to hurt anyone's feelings, but I'm looking out in the room. Some of you aren't going to be here anymore right? And I love you. You're going to be in a better place. But where will the church be? And I'm not talking Broad Street or Triplet Hall or the brick and mortar. My question is, where will the church be? Look at these dudes walking in. That kid's eating a cupcake over there. <laughs> Look at these guys over here. You know, don't miss this. Here, This is it. Don't miss it. Look at me. Give me your eyes. Where will we be? Do you care enough about the truth? Do you care enough about the truth that says that Jesus pushed you? Jesus traded his life for yours. Do you care enough 
to be a part of that symphony for the world? Do you care enough about the truth that God gave his life for the people out there, for these folk right here, for those young ones that just walked in, that we get excited about offering fairness and justice, grace, and an attractive gospel to the world so that everyone knows? Will you be like John Mark and Barnabas and Luke and Paul? Or will you not? As I'm telling you, I believe we are at a very fragile tipping point in our world. I believe we're at a very fragile tipping point. And the question is, will the church stand up now and show the world that there's a different way? I pray. I pray that you guys will do it. My generation was terrible. We were into it for ourselves. We wanted to become rich, rich fast. And so we cheated and lied and stole. We took everything for ourselves. And now 20 years later, we're dealing with the results of my generation. Please be different. We need you. Older friends, you are our greatest generation. Don't give up yet. Don't give up yet. We need you. My generation, let's fix it. Let's fix it. Let's stop walking around in selfish desire. Let's be better than we are. And then let's watch as the kingdom breaks in. My name is Sean Hayden. Micah introduced me. I'm filling in today. Um, we're not preaching out of Colossians because they asked me Thursday evening. <laughs> so I chose something that I could uh, come to a little more quickly. Um, if you would turn to Luke 15 in your Bible, if you have it with you. And if you don't mind standing, please do. This is the story of the prodigal son. I hope this is familiar. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that will belong to me. And so he divided the property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had. He traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine took over throughout the country and he began to be in want. And so he went out and he hired himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to work with pigs. And he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to eat? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and he put his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. And put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And they began to celebrate. And now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and he approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and he said, what's going on? And the servant replied, your brother has come home and your father's killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. And then he became angry and he refused to go in. And his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and now is found. So this is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. And keep this open in front of me. Now, <clears throat> it's a strange question to ask in church, but do any of you read the Bible occasionally? <laughs> Once in a while, it's one of the hazards of my job that I have to read it regularly, and so it helps to enjoy it. For those of you who do read it from time to time, and I suppose you don't even have to read it regularly to answer this question, do you have a favorite passage of Scripture? Do you have a piece of the Bible that you just enjoy that speaks to you that Maybe, maybe not. I, I usually like people to give me answers. I'm a professor, so when I ask a question, I often tell students, and that's, this is where you talk. This is where you're supposed to respond. I know we're used to being passive in church, but I'll let you off the hook this morning. Um, a good teacher of mine once told me, he said, you give them about five seconds, 15 seconds at the most, and then you move on. Otherwise, the silence gets too painful. Um, so, uh, you know, Micah asked me to preach, and I'm, he asked me to preach because I'm preaching the camp meeting tonight at Spring Creek. So I told him, I said, you know, I'm not sure that what I'm doing at Spring Creek at a camp meeting is going to work at Broad Street on Sunday morning. Those are two kind of different audiences. Uh, so I, I thought, you know, I'm finishing that sermon. Starting a new one's going to be tough. So I'm just going to go with something that's easy for me. And it's easy in the sense that this is my favorite passage in the New Testament. This is my favorite passage in the Bible. It is a piece of not just scripture, but just culture, history, art, call it what you want to call it, that has so saturated my mind, my soul in the last 10 years of my life that I can barely think without it. And I just want to talk to you about that this morning. I want to tell you why this means so much to me. Okay? So we've already read it. Now, I can't possibly preach through the whole passage. And I, I'm the kind of person that when I go into lecture, when I go into preach, I like to have every word worked out in advance, and then I can loosen up and ad-lib a little bit, but know that this is not worked out entirely. So just bear with me if you need to. Now, number one, I love this story because I'm a, a teacher. I'm a professor, and I teach religion, and I teach philosophy, which means I teach big questions. I teach the kinds of questions that students and, and people of all ages can get lost in. They're the kinds of questions that particularly for college students, for people who are at a certain age in life, can arouse a lot of anxiety. They can raise a lot of questions about where they are in the world. And so we, we talk in my classes about the nature of good and evil, right and wrong, whether God exists, uh, nature of beauty. And I could, I could go down a long list of things. Courses that as one student, and I teach some courses that as one student told me, they're not really sure what they're about, even when it's over. Right? Now, I'm asking these questions to 19-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and like a lot of students, they're testing the boundaries. These are people often who have literally gone into a far country. They are away from home for the first time. They are learning to live on their own. And for many of them, this means that they've left the church. If they went to church at all, it was their parents' church. And now that they're away, they don't go. They're questioning it. Many of them have decided to give it up. In other words, I like this passage because I teach prodigals. That's my audience. That's who I work with. That's my professional, my personal, my pastoral life is to work with that generation, that, that age group. Now, I, I will tell you, and I'm going to try to restrain some of the harder parts of this sermon, which are some of the harder parts of my, my ministry and my teaching life, because not all of this is fun. Some of it is very dark, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I could tell you some of these stories all day long, but let's just start with one. I'll call him Jonathan. Jonathan came to my class his junior year. Tall, handsome, strong, very thoughtful, pre-med, biology, student athlete, and one of the most vocal and thoughtful students in the class. Also a very aggressive atheist. He was aggressive with me, which I don't mind because at least somebody's talking. He was aggressive with other students. And he was also very critical of his parents, critical of the church, critical of anything that he thought believed in a superficial way in class. So I invited him. I said, why don't you come talk to me after class, son? Why don't you come to my office? And we would spar. We would talk. We would, you know, argue, kind of duke it out with each other. And we started working on his paper, kind of walking through. And he said, you know, what? he said, I'm an atheist. I'm certain of that. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in any of this nonsense. 
And we started talking about why. We started talking about how he wanted to put his paper together. And with no prompting for me, because it's not my job to tell, I tell him, it's not my job to tell you what to think. It's my job to teach you how to think. Now, if you want to talk to me about religion, if you want to talk to me about personal things, we can do that outside of class. But I'm not going to try to convince you of anything in particular in class. That's not my job. That's not a professor's job. But this was outside of class. And in the middle of this conversation, which I can't walk you through all, this student does a 180. He says, I don't believe in God. All that's real is matter. There's no such thing as right and wrong. There is no freedom. There is no truth. There is no meaning. There is no purpose. And that's what I want to articulate in my paper. And three minutes later, he looks at me with tears in his eyes, and he says, but I would change my mind about all of it if I could. I'd go back if I could. I'd believe again if I could, but I don't know how. This is the image of the young man coming to himself. The young man who's gone into the far country, who has lost his faith, who has rejected and squandered, and, and now he realizes that he's in want. He has a question about life's purpose, a question about how he will endure hard days, a question about how to reconcile with his family where those relationships are broken. And he starts to realize that the things he really has said he believes don't have any answers for those questions. But he doesn't know how to come home. And so we've spent the last year together, year and a half, meeting every week, talking. And I'm glad to say that Jonathan's on the way home. He's reconciled with his parents. He goes to church, but he goes with an uneasy conscience. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on, maybe. But he's on the road home. I love this passage because I see it in so many of my students. It's just part of my job now, my vocation. And I see myself in it. I see myself in him. I see myself in many of those students who have gone away and tried to come home. It's an odd thing to see yourself in people like that. It's an odd thing to see yourself in the Bible. It can be really intimidating. I backed in to the far country. I didn't run out looking for it. I was always the good kid. I tried to stay at home. <laughs> I mean, I went, went, you know, I went, what, seven eight, seven, eight hours down the road to college. You know, went on a football scholarship. I'll talk about that in a second. But I wanted to stay at home. I never threw it away. I never rejected the church. I studied. I asked questions. And I woke up one morning and realized I was lost. I didn't get the guidance I needed. And it wasn't that I asked too many questions. It wasn't that I asked the wrong questions. It was just that those questions can lead you into a far place. Those questions leave a lot of room for interpretation, a lot of room for answers. And we live in a time when there's a lot of confusion about those things inside the church, outside the church, in people's hearts. So I woke up one morning and realized I was in the far country. I never meant to go there. And so I look at this parable and I see myself in the prodigal son. I see myself in, in one who was raised in the household of the father, who was given every good thing, who had a great store of faith, and took it off and squandered it unintentionally. And so, strangely, I also see myself in the older brother. The one who resents those who have gone out and wasted because I badly wanted to be at home. And I realized that some, on some form or fashion, I was trying to work it out for myself. I was trying to secure my place in the Father's house. I was going to answer those questions on my own terms. I was going to have it my way. Maybe I didn't seek the guidance where I should have. I could walk you through all of my biography, but it's not that interesting. But I do want to tell you a little bit about it. I grew up in a small Baptist church in western Kentucky. Right. Working class people. My pastor, to give you some idea about what I grew up in, my pastor talked about learning to read the Bible by candlelight in his dad's smokehouse. <laughs> that, that gives you a picture of the kind of church that I grew up in. I went to college on a football scholarship, offensive lineman. I, was a lot, I, I would say I was a lot bigger back then. I was just bigger in different places. It's a... I like to tell people at about 35, there's a metabolic landslide, and everything that was high and firm goes low and loose. There's just nothing you can do about it. It's gravity. I went to college, and I, 
I found my faith really challenged, rattled. And I also found that I was called into the ministry at the same time. I went and I worked for just a short while as a student chaplain in South Carolina State Psychiatric. They called it a hospital, but it was a prison. And I worked with a ward of boys ages 13 to 19. All of them were sex offenders. All of them had been sexually abused. All of them had IQs borderlining in the 60s. No families. They'd been completely... And the, 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 the head, the uh, social worker said, he said, it's a human dumping ground. He said, they have been in every other state institution we can put them in. We cannot put them on the street. There's no home to send them to. And when they leave here, they're going to go to the federal penitentiary. And it broke my heart. And I'm not the, I was not then the kind of person who suffered easily. I had, a, I had a thick skin and a strong jaw. Played middle linebacker in high school. And I came from a long line of hard-nosed people. There's West Kentucky hillbillies. That's why I look like this. Also, I'm on sabbatical. So why not? So my loss of faith, all these questions I couldn't answer, coincided with my call into the ministry. And that's marked me my whole life. I was 21 when that happened. And I have carried that with me, that wound, those questions, and also that call. How do I, how do I respond to these people, to this situation? I went to seminary at Emory University, and I thought that I would get answers in seminary, but you don't get more answers in seminary. You get more questions. And thinking that if I went on a little farther, I would get answers. I went and did a PhD. And so let me tell you that while Nashville, where Vanderbilt is, is about two hours from western Kentucky, from, and I, I often don't say this in pulpits because people don't know what to do with it. Possum Trot, Kentucky. I mean, can you? Yeah. It's about two hours from Possum Trot to Nashville, where Vanderbilt is, existentially, it is a lot farther. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, it is a lot farther. So I know what it's like to be a prodigal. I know what it's like to be the older brother turned into the prodigal. But I never saw myself in the father. A lot of us will look and we'll see ourselves in the older brother. A lot of us will look and we'll see ourselves in the prodigal. But only lately did I start to see myself in the father. If you've never read Henry Nowen's book on the prodigal son, I really recommend it. It's been one of the most important books in my, my adult spiritual journey. Nowen was a Catholic priest. This is a study of a painting by Rembrandt. You know Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son? I didn't before I read the book. And there's a, in the painting, there are some figures in the background, but the center, there's on his knees a young man who's filthy. His shoes are worn out. His clothes are tattered. His ribs are showing through. His head is shaved, which was the mark of a slave. He's been beaten. His hands are emaciated and scarred. And his, <laughs> his hands are resting on the father's chest. And the father is standing, and he's a large man. He's broad. He's wearing richly colored clothes. His face is kind. He's got a long beard. And his hands are resting on his son's shoulders. His hands are resting on his son's shoulders, welcoming him back, encompassing him. And I've thought in my life how many times I've felt like that son. That I've wanted, that, I've wanted the touch of the father. I've wanted to feel that embrace. I now have children of my own. There's nothing that I want more for them than to know that God loves them. Let me say to you that they're only going to know that if you all love them. I grew up in a church where everybody knew everybody, everybody loved everybody. Very close. It was the best of that kind of church. Just, we need to embrace each other. But it's only in the last couple of years that I have learned in my work as a teacher, my work as a pastor, my work as a parent, that I am now called at this stage in my life. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm called to be the father. Now one calls this the authority of compassion. To be the one who runs out and in the name of the Father, in the name of the church, welcomes in those who are lost, who goes and finds them. And I'm going to come back to that. More of us need to learn this role. Not to see ourselves in the older son, not to see ourselves in the prodigal, but to see ourselves in the Father.
And finally, I love this parable, and this is a deep mystery to me, and I could talk about this all day. And in some sense, this is just, if you want a summary of what my vocational life is as an academic, which is something that the hillbilly in me really doesn't rest easily with, it's to understand what I'm about to tell you. And that's that this is a parable of our age. It's not just about me. It's not just about these students of mine. It is a parable of our time. And let me try to tell you very briefly what I think that means. I'm used to hearing two stories. One is the story of the younger son before he's lost his confidence. The other is the story of the son who stayed at home. Let me tell you these two stories in outline. That first story, the story of the younger son before he lost his confidence, is the story of the modern secular world. It's a world of scientific rationality, a world of democratic political values, a world of capitalist economics. It is a world in which we have decided as human beings to stand on our own two feet and to let reason do its work. It's the story of the Enlightenment. I teach a lot of history classes. The church cannot claim any of these things for itself. The church didn't give us democracy. The church didn't give us science. The church, in fact, the church has fought these things from, you know, at, at moments in its history. So for 300 years, the secular world has told itself a story about coming of age, growing up. And this is quite literally the language that was used, was growing up, becoming adults, and learning to put away the superstition, the authority, right? the mindlessness of religion. It's the kind of story that Jacob could mouth, or Jonathan could mouth to me when he came into my class. Church is, you know, church is blind authority. Faith means blind authority. It means superstition. It means, and we have to put those things behind us. And we have to stand up on our own two feet. We have to think for ourselves. It's childishness. It belongs to a bygone age. That's one story I'm very accustomed to hearing from my fellow academics. But for all the goods of this modern world, for its reason, it has also brought extraordinary waste. And that is what the word prodigal means, is waste. And I don't just mean the landfills and the other cesspools that hide all of our excesses. What I mean is that this waste is spiritual, it is moral, it is human. And I could go on for a very long time about this in the pulpit today. But in this now, there is an anxiety the kind of anxiety I saw in Jonathan about where will bread for tomorrow, and maybe not the bread that we put in our stomach, but the food for our heart. Where will meaning come from? Who will guide me? How will I create a community? The church, for its part, has often played and still often plays the part of the older brother. It turns up its nose at anything new, anything that disagrees with it, anything that challenges it, it acts resentful and it stomps its feet. Again, I could go on and on about that. And so my question is when are these two things going to come together? How are they to come together? I feel like that's a great part of the struggle in the Methodist church right now. The father does not run out and lie down in the pig slop. The son has to get up and come home. To what extent should the church say yes and the church say no to the world in which we live. That is the high art of preaching. That is the question of the church's life in this age. When do we run out? When do we embrace? What do we sanction with the robe, the ring, the sandals, and acknowledge that this world has some things right, which the church has had wrong? But how do we make that judgment? That's the crucial question, and I'm not going to answer that for you today. Instead, I want to end talking about one more prodigal, the one who kind of started this for me. When I was in seminary, I was a youth pastor in Georgia. I served a small church, a church plant. Um, it was about an hour down the road from, well, an hour mean, meaning about 50 miles from Atlanta, which really meant three hours. <laughs> this is what I'm learning. All right. um, and I was a youth minister, and we started with four kids, and we built that group. And I got very close to some of them. I was there for three years. And there was one, one of these young men, and he was, he was tall and athletic and handsome and smart and talented. He played the guitar and the piano and played half a dozen instruments. And he grew up, and, you know, I, 
he was in eighth grade when I left. And we stayed in touch through high, his high school years, at least the first couple. And as time, time does, we drifted. I always thought about him. I loved him deeply. He was like a little brother to me. And I told him I loved him, and he told me that he loved me. And two or three years had gone by, maybe five, and I got an email from his mom saying, you know, Ethan might appreciate a call from you. I called his dad and I said, what's going on? He said, Sean, he said, it's hard, to, it's hard to tell. He said, I think you better just come down here and hear it from him. So I got my truck and I drove, drove down to South Georgia. And I talked to his parents, said hi, and we, Ethan and I got in the car and we drove, we went on a long walk. He told me how in high school he really excelled in his grades and sports and music. He'd been offered scholarships for college, and he had an opportunity to tour with a major act, two major country acts, Florida Georgia Line, a couple others. And he'd gone out on the road, and he'd gotten far from home. And alcohol and drugs and the life on that road had gotten the best of him. And he spent years in it, and it damaged his mind. And I don't mean in a spiritual way. I mean physically damaged him. Difficulty concentrating, thinking, couldn't work. And he told me all these things with his sitting on the ground. He's about six, seven. <laughs> with his head between his legs, weeping. And he showed me the marks on his wrists. And I love this young man with all my heart. And I thought to myself, what kind of world have we made that takes these young people and pulls them in this direction? And that, for me, was the beginning of my work as a father. And I put my hands on his shoulders, and I put my arms around him. I said, I said, Ethan, I love you, and God loves you. And I'll walk with you as long as we need to walk to get back home. And I'm glad to say that he's cleaned up. He's finishing school. He's working. He's back in church. But he's back in church with an uneasy conscience, and this is what I want you to hear. Because the church doesn't understand him. It doesn't understand the road he's been on. It doesn't understand his doubts. It doesn't understand his anxieties. It doesn't understand his damage. And that's what I mean when I say that we act like the older brother. I have a school full of prodigals. They're looking for a place. And what, I, what I'm trying to figure out is where can I take them? If I brought him to you, would you know what to do with him? I, I, I can't take care of all of them. I can't take care of one of them. I've got my own care. What I need is a church I can bring them into that will love them, that will steer them, that will shape them, that will help them get cleaned up. And what I want to know is, 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 can this place be that? And so what I want you to ask yourself is, who are you in this parable? Are you the younger son? Are you still in the far country? Are you the older son? Are you sitting at home, sulking, Do you, you know, resentful that the church is declining in membership, or we've got all this difficulty? Or have you come into your own as the father? Are you learning to love and to reach out and to bless and to bring together because that is what we desperately need in this hour as the church. We've just got a few minutes left. And I'm going to stop there. But I want you to take a minute and I want you to think about that. Think about the authority of compassion. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.